Welcome to the 700 Club. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, there was a popular TV show featuring a little dummy named Charlie McCarthy. He was a little dummy that wore a tuxedo, and he sat on the uh, uh, lap of a ventriloquist whose name was Edgar Bergen. And Charlie McCarthy, would, and they would talk together because the ventriloquist could uh, project his voice. And so as the dummy talked, the voice behind him was Edgar Bergen. And it was very popular. You know, I wonder now, when I listen to the nonsense that's being spoken about the infrastructure bill, when I listen to the nonsense that's being spoken about uh, what happened in Georgia, and I listen to uh, comments by a senator from New York, a Democrat, who said the following, paid leave is infrastructure, child care is infrastructure, caregiving is infrastructure. What nonsense. But I ask myself, who is the ventriloquist behind all this? And I'm not sure anybody knows for sure, but it does seem that there's somebody somewhere that is controlling the action and the dummy is just speaking. And when it speaks, strange things come out of its mouth. Well, in other news, a catastrophic war with China. It could happen if the Chinese government invades Taiwan. Beijing sees President Biden as weak. So will China risk a shooting war with the United States? And what must the U.S. do to prevent it? Dale Hurd brings us this alarming report. China has ramped up military operations in the Taiwan Strait significantly in recent days. And there are fresh fears of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. China views Taiwan as a renegade province and could be tempted to make a move because, according to some experts, Beijing sees the Biden administration as weak. But would China actually risk war over Taiwan? And then what would America do? While China talks tough and has improved its military by stealing technology from the United States, Chinese leaders are keenly aware their military has not fought a major war in 42 years. And when it did in 1979, it lost, in the view of some experts, to Vietnam. But the commander of the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet warned the Senate Armed Services Committee that taking over Taiwan remains China's number one strategic priority. My opinion is this problem is much closer to us than most uh, think, and I, we have to take this on with urgency. With China's military untested in combat, while America's has been fighting in several nations, some experts say the last thing China wants is a shooting war with the United States. But China's true intentions remain a mystery. I think it would be very, very dangerous to assume that all of this is just saber rattling. China would certainly prefer to reunify with Taiwan peacefully. What the Chinese leadership has made clear over the last 70 years is they are prepared to use force if it is necessary. What might help prevent an invasion of Taiwan would be an actual agreement with the United States to defend the island. There is no defense pact between the United States and Taiwan now, but something officials call strategic ambiguity, which means China doesn't know if the U.S. will defend the island or not. It's a strategy that was condemned during a recent online House subcommittee hearing on Taiwan. Strategic ambiguity uh, relative to Taiwan and China is, in my opinion, absurd and dangerous. We ought to be crystal clear that if China attacks Taiwan, we will be there with Taiwan. Pentagon simulations show the U.S. losing a war with China over Taiwan, primarily because U.S. bases are so far from the island. And China may have already decided that now is the time to strike. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. They did it in Hong Kong, and the next uh, target is Taiwan, and we cannot allow it to happen, but we will if we're weak. We've got to have strength, and we have got to position forces over there. It means we need to build our Navy. We don't have enough Navy ships. We don't have enough carriers, and China could overwhelm us if there's a shooting war over Taiwan. 
But we cannot allow the Chinese mainland to take over that independent republic. And if we do, we will lose face all over Asia. But it means we've got to be prepared. And are we prepared as a nation to go for it? The answer is probably not. And if we're spending all our time on a diversity training and all the stuff that goes on in the military, we're not going to be ready to fight a war. And we have to have our loins girt about, as the Bible says, ready to go. And if we are ready to go, that is the best way to prevent a conflict, is we're strong. And it's peace through strength. Well, President Biden is also facing another big challenge. Russia is raising red flags in the Arctic. Ephraim Graham has that story. Pat, Russian President Vladimir Putin congratulated his military for its performance during recent Arctic drills. The Russian military told Putin the exercise featured three nuclear submarines simultaneously breaking through the Arctic ice and warplanes flying over the North Pole. Russia has made it a priority to beef up its military presence in the Arctic. The region is believed to hold up to one quarter of the Earth's undiscovered oil and gas. Putin has quoted estimates, put the value of the Arctic mineral riches at $30 trillion. Russia, the U.S., Canada, and Denmark, and Norway have all been trying to assert jurisdiction over parts of the Arctic. Here at home, the Centers for Disease Control says the more deadly and contagious U.K. variant is now the most common strain in the United States. This comes as President Biden announced this week, every American adult will be eligible for the coronavirus vaccine by April 19th. CBN News Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson has this story. While new variants of COVID-19 are rapidly spreading across the country, the good news is the vaccines seem to be effective against them. Still, President Biden warns we're in a race against time. We're still in a life and death race against this virus. Biden hopes we'll see a return to normal by the 4th of July, but encourages Americans to take precautions until then. Even moving at the record speed we're moving at, we're not even halfway through vaccinating over 300 million Americans. This is going to take time. 44 percent of new COVID cases are coming from just five states, New York, New Jersey, Florida, Pennsylvania and Michigan. We're seeing the numbers go up and um, we're still seeing that sick patient population coming in. Um, we can definitely feel that there is an uptick, you know, for the sick patient coming in. Michigan healthcare workers say they're concerned by the ages of the patients being hospitalized. Uh, we're seeing a lot more um, younger adults, middle aged adults being affected, getting sick and coming in. The CDC director warns daycare centers and youth sports are leading to a rise in cases amongst youth. 65,000 cases, that's 65,000 opportunities for, for mutations to occur, um, for more variants to spread. But Dr. Anthony Fauci says there is good news on the efficacy of the vaccines. Antibodies delivered by vaccination persist at least through six months and likely from the shape of the curve, well beyond that. And he assures Americans the end will come. We'll know it when we see it. It'll be obvious as the numbers come down rather dramatically. And when they do, we're going to wind up getting really stepwise, much, much more towards what we consider approaching a degree of normality, which everyone really quite dramatically notices. It. It's on the way. Hang in there. Dr. Fauci also says the federal government will not require American citizens to carry vaccine passports, although he foresees some businesses implementing their own rules requiring them. Reporting from Virginia, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. President Biden is set to unveil a series of executive orders addressing gun violence today. One area he will address is tighter regulations requiring buyers of homemade guns to undergo background checks. He will also nominate David Chipman to be the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. Chipman is a former federal agent and advisor of a gun control group. 
President Biden may have a big problem getting his massive infrastructure package through Congress. Senator Joe Manchin, a key Democrat, said under no circumstance would he support passing bills like the infrastructure bill without Republican support. The potential setback coming as the president unveiled details of his plan. George Thomas is on this story. The president's massive infrastructure plan faces stiff resistance in the months ahead. Republicans calling it a big liberal spending agenda that comes with major tax hikes. While on the left, progressive Democrats are demanding even more money to tackle things like climate change. President Biden says he's open to negotiating the details of the $2 trillion plus package. However, here's what we won't be open to. We will not be open to doing nothing. Inaction simply is not an option. While the plan calls for spending around $820 billion on roads, bridges, railways, airports, and power grids, there's also massive amounts of money going to projects that Republicans say isn't related to infrastructure, like $400 billion for care for the elderly and disabled. This package that they've laid out at the beginning, styled infrastructure, is a Trojan horse for massive tax increases and a whole lot of more debt and a whole lot of spending. Republicans say that extra spending coming from Democrats stretching their definition of infrastructure. New York's Democratic Senator Kirsten Gillibrand getting flack after she tweeted that paid leave is infrastructure, child care is infrastructure, caregiving is infrastructure. Republicans like Ted Cruz pushing back. Abortion is infrastructure. Gun control is infrastructure. Forced unionization is infrastructure. Whatever the left wants is infrastructure, Cruz tweeted. Politico estimated that only about 37% of the bill will be spent on what the president himself defines as infrastructure projects. The president defending the amount of spending in the bill. I've heard from my Republican friends... Uh, say that it's, many of them say it's too big. They say, why not focus on traditional infrastructure? We are America. We don't just fix for today. We build for tomorrow. The president wants to fund his agenda by raising the corporate tax rate to 28 percent, rolling back former President Trump's 2017 tax cuts and expanding the global minimum tax rate to 21 percent. Republican lawmakers and business groups argue the hikes will crush American competitiveness. What the president proposed this week is not an infrastructure bill. It, it's a huge tax increase for one thing, and it's a tax increase on small businesses, on job creators in the United States of America. Democrats hoping to use a budget reconciliation process to bypass Republican opposition got a major setback from one of their very own today. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, a key Democrat, said under no circumstances would he support passing bills like the infrastructure one without Republican support. I simply do not believe budget reconciliation should replace regular order in the Senate, Manchin wrote in the Washington Post. Senate Democrats must avoid the temptation to abandon our Republican colleagues on important national issues. George Thomas, CBN News. This bill looks dead in the water, Pat. Well, it looks like it depends so much on the health and safety of Senator Joe Manchin. He's become a hero. But uh, possibly Christy Gillibrand from out in Arizona, there are just two of them, and they're standing in the way of monstrous, monstrous overhaul of our entire nation. And it's going to be jammed through if Joe Biden has his way and his allies and the the squad, as they're called in the House, if they could jam this stuff through, they'll do it by executive order and by fiat and all the rest of it. But, you know, if I were you, I sure would pray for Joe Manchin. And, you know, because May he live a long life. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the, the guy with his finger on the dike, and if he takes it out, the, whole, the flood will come upon us, and it will be horrible. So please pray for America, all right? A strong feeling of foreboding. That's what led a pastor in Lebanon to order his staff to go home and to cancel Bible classes for 200 children. Well, what followed next? 
And how did it lead to a jaw-dropping miracle that has now spread around the world? Wendy Griffith brings us this astounding story. Things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Pastor Saeed Deeb of Beirut's Life Center Church told us how a strange feeling came over him the day of the explosion. I don't know what happened to my heart. And I was feeling uh, not, not at ease. And I don't know what to explain it. I felt something is going to happen. Uh, something bad is going to happen. That uneasiness led Pastor Deeb to send his 34-person staff home and cancel Bible classes for more than 200 children. As if the Holy Spirit say, go, 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 go. So I was saying, everybody, go, go, go home, go home, go home, pushing them, turn off the computers, forcing them to leave. I was forcing them. And they said, we are cooking. We need to, to distribute food for refugees and for the poor. I said, today, cancel everything, put it in the fridge. So they, they were thinking, I lost my mind. But they didn't know, and I didn't know, this is the Holy Spirit prompting. Then, shortly after 6 p.m. on August 4th, the unthinkable happened. Oh, boy. Without warning, a large amount of ammonium nitrate stored at the Beirut port exploded, possibly ignited by a warehouse fire. The shockwaves damaged buildings, roads, and shattered glass for miles in the densely populated city. When it was over, more than 200 people were dead, upwards of 7,000 injured, and 300,000 homeless. And I thought, this is the end. This is the end. But the Lord has an another plan. Located only a mile from the epicenter, Pastor Deeb's 4,000-square-meter Life Center Church saw great damage. Now everything I built in 12 years, I saw it destroyed on the floor. All the ceilings on the floor, all the lamps, all the paintings, all, air, all the doors, doors without frames, windows, and, you know, all it's glass, all of it in glass and aluminum. It's horrible. And I was really crying and crying. It also led to desperation for the people of Beirut as they lacked the basic necessities of food, shelter, and water. Although facing great need, Life Center Church reached out to help as many victims as possible. Pastor Deeb says that's when another miracle took place. He told CBN News his story of heeding the Holy Spirit and sending everyone home. That interview was seen around the world, and relief started pouring in. Uh, praise God, we've been able to uh, raise the center back to its normal center and even better. We we debt free. We don't have any debts anymore, and uh, extra funds we get, we were able to help 800 families eat those affected families every month with food parcels. So since day one, we were giving food away with the little money we had, and the Lord kept sending, sending, sending. But Deep says the overall situation in Beirut remains desperate. Much of the city lies in rubble, leaving many without hope. Everybody wants to, to flee the country. They're trying to go in boats. And, and they're dying in boats, actually, every day. But please, pray for us to give hope to all those around us, to strengthen them, especially the leaders. Deep says despite the horror of that deadly explosion, God is bringing something good from the ashes. I'm seeing people coming to Jesus like never before, never. When you speak to and, and a big number of priests coming to faith, big number of priests coming uh, to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the signs and wonders following them. So I think it's, it's the time for Lebanon. Deep says he's grateful people around the world saw his story and helped in their time of need. Thank you so much, uh, especially for you and for CBN and for all those who are watching us. People from all around the world, from all around the world, start sending small amounts, big amounts, and praise God for the church. The first time I see the body of Christ in action to help uh, the churches here and to help the people who have been affected by the blast. He feels God is not done with Lebanon. So many promises in the Bible, and suddenly Lebanon will be transformed into a fertile field, and everybody will be my disciples, says the Lord, in Lebanon. Can you imagine? Wendy Griffith, CBN News. Lebanon was called the Paris of the Middle East. It was one of the most beautiful cities. I just love going there. <clears throat> it, it, was, it was a paradise. And then, of course, the uh, uh, PLO came in. They began to have a war, and it was just a bloody mess. 
But uh, pray for that guy. I mean, it's amazing. The Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave just because there's an explosion, just because there's bad politics. The Holy Spirit was there in Lebanon and is continuing. And thank God for that pastor. Well, how about this? IBS, acid reflux, GERD, ulcers and ulcerated colitis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, bacterial and fungal overgrowth, autoimmune diseases, brain-related conditions. Dr. Colbert has got the answer to all of these things in case you happen to have them. Physician, heal thyself. Dr. Don Colbert has had to do just that. He was suffering from recurring bouts of sickness. So how did he find a cure? Take a look. Helping his patients and readers get healthy is Dr. Don Colbert's passion. Before he studied nutrition, he had become quite unhealthy himself. Dr. Colbert believes the condition of the gut determines much of one's overall health. He explains how gut problems lead to a long list of diseases and the solutions that can prevent them in his newest book, Dr. Colbert's Healthy Gut Zone. Well, joining us now is Dr. Don Colbert. Uh, doctor, it's good to see you. Why is the gut health so important to overall health? Well, Pat, I didn't realize this back 35 years ago when I started medicine, but now I know that up to 90% of all disease starts with an unhealthy gut. And I went through that in the late 80s, and little did I realize that I had put the problem on myself by prescribing myself antibiotics when I got sick with a sinus infection or bronchitis. And instead of resting my body and taking good nutrition and good food, I didn't rest. I simply took an antibiotic, and I, do, I would do this every four to six months when I'd get sick and run down. And eventually, I developed irritable bowel syndrome, where I had all kind of abdominal bloating and gas and diarrhea. But I just took some meds to stop it because this was when I was practicing conventional medicine. But then a few years later, I developed psoriasis and autoimmune disease. But what I really developed was I developed leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability, which sets the stage for almost every chronic disease and especially autoimmune diseases, which psoriasis is just one of many. Well, now, and so what, I, what is this leaky gut thing? I mean, does it actually leak? I mean, is, is, there, is that an actual term? Well, a leaky gut doesn't mean you need to wear the pens or a diaper. That's not that. <laughs> A leaky gut simply means, if you can picture a coffee filter, and picture filling that coffee filter with coffee, and you, you brew a nice cup of coffee. But now picture that coffee filter, which is symbolizes your small intestines where your nutrition is absorbed. Now, picture taking an ice pick and poking holes in that coffee filter, and then pouring the coffee in there and making your cut a cu cup of coffee. What happens? You have all these coffee grounds that should have been kept out goes into your coffee. A similar thing happens with leaky gut, which is increased intestinal permeability, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has made this intestinal lining, the small intestines, to be a semi-permeable membrane composed of finger-like projections. And these cells are one cell thick in the small intestines, but the surface area of these cells is spread out is the size of a tennis court. The job of this is to allow us to absorb our nutrients, our simple sugars, our fatty acids, our amino acids, our vitamins, our minerals, but it's to keep out all the bad, the yeast, the uh, undigested food particles, the toxins, the chemicals. But what happens is our gut is damaged, mainly brought on by a lot of the meds doctors prescribe, and it pries these cells open, these finger-like projections get pried open, and we develop microscopic holes like that coffee filter that's been poked, that's had holes poked in it with that, uh, you know, you, you can poke holes in it with that ice pick, and then all of a sudden the coffee grounds come through. But what comes through is partially digested food. Mm -hmm. And what that is, it's inflammation in the gut, food sensitivities, irritable bowel symptoms, gut symptoms, but eventually it causes systemic inflammation. That same inflammation starts to affect the blood brain barrier opens it up so we get inflammatory mediators into the brain leading to depression, anxiety, ADHD, dementia, Parkinson's, but one of the biggest things is obesity. 
When we have the gut compromised, bad bacteria start to overgrow, good bacteria are diminished, and then we get an abundance of this bacteria called firmicutes that cause us to crave more sugar, carbs, and starches, and they cause us to extract more calories from our food. So it starts with simply medications and food. So I talk about the seven key foods or the seven key things that trigger a leaky gut, and then the foods that perpetuate the leaky gut. And the most common meds are antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors or acid blocking meds and anti-inflammatory meds, but also GMO foods and artificial sweeteners. These kill off the good bacteria in our gut. Uh, and Doctor, let, let me ask you this. I mean, how many dentists are that they give antibiotics? They, they, they think it's an infection in your tooth. How many doctors are there that understand what you're talking about? This is a, a, a health crisis in America, and a lot of it's caused by the fact we start throwing antibiotics to little children when they're little in their you know, infancy. Absolutely right. And again, what happens so often is they overprescribe antibiotics, and then after the antibiotics, right, with probiotics and prebiotics that, that simply get the good bacteria growing again. Because, Pat, what happened to me with my IBS and the psoriasis, to make a long story short, I changed my diet. I took, took some gut healing uh, supplements that heal a leaky gut. I planted good bacteria. I killed off the yeast and the bad bacteria. The IBS healed. The psoriasis went away, and I've been 30 years without psoriasis. And that's an autoimmune disease they say is incurable. But I've, done, I've used this program for the last 30 years for my patients, and we see absolute miracles with transforming the gut health because the gut health is the foundation of all health. Well, talk and about the foods that will do the job for you. What okay, the foods that do the job are not GMO foods. Yeah. They're living foods. In fact, I talk about what... So let's talk about the foods that heal you. Mainly, these are the key gut healing foods. Lots of veggies, lots of olive oil, high in polyphenols, as well as what we call resistant starches that feed the good bacteria in the gut that produces butyrate, which helps to heal the gut. Resistant starches are green bananas, but when they turn yellow, they're full of sugar. Sugar, carbs, and starches feed the bad bacteria and prevent the gut from healing, but also fiber, soluble, especially soluble insoluble, like psyllium husk powder. It is so good for helping to heal the gut, as well as probiotics, prebiotics, and polyphenols, I call them my gut power tools. <laughs> and, and polyphenols are olive oil, green tea, black tea, organic coffee, dark chocolate, berries, berries, berries. These are gut healing, gut restoring foods. And then probiotic foods like kombucha. I, I tell people goat milk or coconut yogurt or kefir. Dairy is highly inflammatory for the gut. That mm. needs to be left on the altar for a while. And so I simply put it all together with a low carb, low starch, no sugar diet, crucify the flesh for about four to six weeks, your gut heals, then you can introduce some of the foods you love. But one of the greatest foods that harm the gut is gluten or wheat. Mm. Once the gut is compromised, wheat contains 23,000, over 23,000 proteins that can inflame the gut because gut is highly inflammatory because it's no longer the amber fields of grain that we used to see hundreds of years ago. Now it's dwarf wheat, which is highly inflammatory, and it causes tremendous weight gain. So we... Doctor, let me, how do you get gluten-free? Gluten is what holds the flour together, isn't it? I mean, are, are, there, are there breads that don't have gluten in them? Absolutely there are, and that's the good part about it. We have gluten-free breads that don't have that inflammatory protein in it. There's also millet bread. There's also paleo and keto breads and seed breads, but gluten is inflammatory. To heal the gut, we need to lay gluten on the altar for at least uh, four to six weeks. Now, I had to lay it on the altar for years. <laughs> now I can have a little bit and it won't hurt me, but gluten is still my enemy. Well, you, and so- You, you talk in your book about uh, the bacteria that if we get rid of all the bacteria we've done ourselves a, a disservice so we really yeah. need to get out and pray in the dirt tell us about that okay right well what's happened as a society we overuse soaps and cleansers 
We see our body is composed of over 100 trillion good bacteria that literally makes up two thirds to 70% of our immune system. And when we wash all the bacteria off of our skin, off of our body, and, and we keep washing it off, literally it'll eventually affect your health. So again, we're too clean. We need to have a little <laughs> healthy dirt, not dirt from the slums, but dirt from the fields, from the playground. Healthy dirt is good for us because it has that good bacteria in it. Well, you've got the lawyers saying kids can't play outside. It's really good when they're playing in the dirt and playing football and out there roughing things up. Then is that right? Absolutely right, because the good bacteria trains our immune system, and so many people are hyper clean. Let your I, in fact, when my grandkids come over, I don't give them a bath for a day or two. But <laughs> I'm helping their good bacteria. Now the mom gets mad at me, but I say no. Up in their immune system. I'm training their immune system. <laughs> don't stink. Kids don't stink. Okay. Well, Doctor, I, I think, you know, we're, we have as a nation, there is a crisis of obesity. It's unbelievable how fat we are. And this book, ladies and gentlemen, has the answer. You really need to get it. Dr. Colbert's Healthy Gut Zone. It's a fabulous book. And uh, we can get it wherever books are sold, I guess. Uh, doctor, is there any uh, special place we can order it? Well, they can get it at Amazon. They can go to drcolbert.com, or most any bookstore will carry this book. But if they can't find it, go to my website, drdrcolbert.com. Uh, we do have a crisis of obesity in America, don't we? Absolutely. But again, what we find is most of those obese patients, when we examine their microbiome or their gut bacteria, is too many firmicutes from too much sugar, carbs, and starches and not enough living food. Our body was created to consume living food, not GMO foods, not sugars, carbs, and starches. And so we simply repair the gut by choosing living foods that heal the gut. God bless you. Fabulous. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't recommend this strongly enough. People, you know, I'm 91 years old when people say what goes on. I follow a lot of what the doctor is I saying. I, I mean, religiously, I, I, I eat a lot of vegetables. I, I'm not eating a lot of beef. And I take probiotics and prebiotics and berries and berries and uh, lots of berries. And, and uh, I just love them and bran and oatmeal and things like that. Ladies and gentlemen, it works. Please get the man's book. <laughs> I want you to stay healthy. And welcome to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. Israel marks Holocaust Remembrance Day today to mourn the 6 million Jews who died in the Holocaust at the hands of the Nazis before and during World War II. A two-minute siren sounded throughout the country as Israelis stood in silence to remember those lost in World War II in the darkest chapter in the history of the Jewish people. Franklin Graham is celebrating a major victory in a religious freedom case in the United Kingdom. Graham and area churches planned a festival of hope in Lancashire in 2018 and purchased ads for on-area buses, but the local government took them down. Graham sued and the court ruled Christians and people of other faiths can publicly express their religious views. Graham wrote, we thank God for this ruling because it is a win for every Christian in the UK. Want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. Flashbacks to the horrors of the Holocaust. That's what haunted Tanya all during the COVID pandemic. She lives in Israel under strict restrictions to shelter in place. So how is she getting the food and supplies that she needs to survive? Take a look. Tanya was 14 years old when the Holocaust began in Ukraine. The stress of the recent COVID-19 outbreak and lockdown in Israel has caused Tanya's memories of those terrible times to resurface. I remember life was so normal until that day. The war started and everything changed. Many of our family and friends died. Tanya's mother worked at a local hospital, so they escaped on a hospital train. Tanya tended to the wounded as the hospital train accompanied the Red Army along the front lines. It was very difficult to be around all that blood and death but we knew what the Nazis were doing to the Jews. I would have felt shame not doing my part to help. 
Tanya was honored by the Soviets for her heroic service during the war. Now living in Israel, Tanya had to self-isolate to avoid catching the coronavirus, which means she can't go out to get groceries. So CBN Israel brings her food while taking precautions to keep her safe. Thank you so much for this food. It's very noble thing for you to want to help me and other Holocaust survivors without even knowing us. Thanks to those who support CBN Israel, Tanya is able to get the food and encouragement she needs during this crisis. I am so very grateful to God to have met you. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to be able to help people. I, I love what she says. It's a miracle that you would be willing to help those of us you don't even know. Isn't that the heart of Christ? And you know, you have an opportunity to be a part of this, not just for Holocaust survivors in Israel. 700 club members are doing this kind of work all around the globe every single day. And you can be a part of that. It's just 65 cents a day. That's a $20 a month commitment. And with that, we're changing the world because thousands and thousands have said, yes, I want to make a difference. Won't you join with us? Our number's toll free. It's so easy to call. 1-800-700-7000. Just call, say. I want to join the 700 Club. Here's another good reason to join. We've got a great thank you for joining Gift for You. It's Pat's latest book called I Have Walked with the Living God. It's a remarkable book. In fact, I want to share with you what Barbara had to say. She lives in Greenville, South Carolina. She said, I have walked with the living God is interesting, exciting, entertaining, inspirational, and absolutely fantastic. I am 87 years old, and I can't remember enjoying any book as much as this one. Wow, Barbara. Mm. Glad to hear from I'm you. That must bless it. your heart because this is your life story. It is a story, but it's more than that. It's a story of God's dealing God's with human faithfulness. beings, and yes. and it's just a, a great testimony of, of victory of mm -hmm. seeing the Lord work. Yes, Amen. absolutely. So call now because we want you to have the book and yeah. we want you to help us reach out to people around the world. Time for some email. Are you oh, ready? Let's go for it. Okay, this first one comes from Phil who says, I am a senior citizen with an adjustable mortgage. I've been praying and believing God for a debt-free mortgage. With the interest rates so low, if I refinance, would I be guilty of unbelief? Well, there's no guilty of unbelief but getting the best interest rates you can. Sure. And uh, the interest rates are so low, and I, I think it'd be very wise uh, to to refinance. I mean, you, you can just do the math and say, all right, I'm paying this, and if I refinance, there may be some costs associated. And if there are, how much more is it going to cost me? And will I come out ahead financially? But God isn't going to punish you for being smart. <laughs> right? exactly. Do not forsake wisdom is what the Bible says. All right. Okay. Effie says, hi, Pat. Can you describe for me what hell is going to be like? Uh, it is torment beyond imagination. Mm. Uh, the Bible says the fire will not die. The worm will not die. No, the fire will not be quenched. The worm will not die. And it's forever. The thing about hell is... It is forever. It is forever, forever and ever and ever, torment et eternally. And hell was made only for the devil and his angels. It was never intended for human beings. And for to people go there, I mean, it's just horrible to contemplate. Uh, you know, you can't describe anything as horrible, but it's eternal separation from God. It is uh, it's eternal remorse, not knowing I mean, it's, you're always going to feel guilty of the fact that I could have accepted the Lord and didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we urge people, you know, be reconciled to God. There's only one life. You're not going to have a second shot at it. All right. This is Sylvia who says, my parents left their property to us when they died and my brothers and sisters want to sell it, but I don't want to sell. I hate conflicts, but we don't need the money and the land is beautiful. What would you do? Well, again, it's the question of uh, who, who are the property rights, uh, how many children, uh, what percentage is owned. And you might just sit down with the, the others and say, look, can I buy you out? Do you want money? And my share is worth $10,000, and I'll pay you ten. You release it, and the, 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 the property will be mine. All right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Kat who says, Hi, Pat. Revelation 19.10 says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? 
Well, it, it means that talking about Jesus is, is the answer to everything. The, the pro prophecy is, is foretelling, it's, it tells the, the testimony of Jesus tells you what's going to go on in the world forever, okay? Mm -hmm. This is Sean who says, I'd like to sell my house while the market is hot, but then I'm worried about buying another house because I keep hearing about bidding wars. Would it be a good idea to sell and then rent something for a year until things cool off? Uh, I think it's a good idea as long as you've got some place to park your money. You don't want to lose your money once you sell, but if the market is hot as a firecracker right now, uh, single family uh, homes are being bought up by funds as well as individuals. And if you've got a good piece of property, you get a good price for it. Remember, you've got to. You, you, there may be some capital gains tax that you'll have to pay on it, so you'll have so much money left. But then make sure you know what, where the money goes. You, you know, I, I, I don't even. Well, it used to be you could put it in treasuries, but treasuries the, the interest rate is so low. I, I could tell you there are a, a number of funds that are paying eight, nine percent interest. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. ETFs, so, um, but anyhow, uh, that, that's not a bad, bad play, all right? Don't you risk, though, the interest rates? I mean, one of the reasons people are buying is because the interest rates are so low. Well, exactly. I mean, that's why, you, well, the, they get low, but the, the, as the interest rates go low, the prices are going up. Yeah, it's And crazy. And the prices of, of residential property are through the roof right now. So it's not a bad time to sell, all mm -hmm. right? This is Mary Lou who says, my husband doesn't believe in tithing. He's totally against it. I tithe. Lately, I've been wanting to increase my amount, but I would need to use his money. Is it wrong to tithe without telling my husband? Uh, look, you know, we don't want to set up deception yeah. in a family. I mean, husbands and wives need to have communication with one another. And maybe you could explain to your husband the blessing that come about from tithing. Maybe you can get some examples. There are plenty of testimonies of people who've been blessed by giving. Uh, but uh, you don't want to, you're asking me, should you take your husband's money without letting him know to give it away? Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. All right. Okay. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for those questions. Thank you for your questions all right. and your answers. And more coming up, right? Unbearable pain. Alex Sore could barely walk after hurting his legs. Then overnight, Alex was completely healed. The astonishing surprise, Alex received a creative miracle. Alex Sore loves hunting and fishing. I just really started to get an appreciation for God's creation outdoors. I think God's a lot more prevalent out in nature. Alex is a cancer survivor. When he was 16, a malignant tumor was found in his right foot. It had to be amputated just above the ankle. He was fitted with a prosthetic limb that took time to get used to walking with. That leg with the prosthetic was too long, and they can't shorten it up. They wanted me to wear uh, an insert or like this big rubber thing glued to the bottom of my shoe. I was an 19-year-old kid. I was way too cool for that. So I said, no, I don't hurt, it doesn't hurt, I'm not wearing that thing. 10 years later, Alex injured his hip and leg while exercising. Yeah, one day I was, I was exercising and I pulled too hard or pushed too hard on it or something. I felt something give kind of in my hip and my leg on that side and yeah, I couldn't walk or anything. It hurt too bad. I could walk maybe like five minutes. It was difficult for Alex to fish or hunt, and the pain gradually became unbearable. It was so bad. My legs were, the bad leg was actually moving like involuntarily. I didn't want it to move, but like the nerves and everything were just shooting so much. I couldn't hold it still. I was actually, I was crying, not gonna lie, in bed. Alex began asking God for healing. I was praying about it, and I just believed. I knew that you can't please God without faith, and he'd done so much for me up to that point. I was like, there's no way, Lord, that this is how you, this is, there's no way this is the plan. There's no, this isn't where it ends up. I got these 
dreams and aspirations of being a great like hunter and fisherman and all this and why would you put that in me if this is how it was going to end up the next day while watching the 700 club alex saw pat and wendy praying there's a problem with your hips your 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 spine and your hips are out of line and uh, you've got pain coming up the small of your back uh, it's not scoliosis but it acts that way in the name of Jesus, we speak the word. In the name of Jesus, may the spine be healed, may the hips be aligned properly, and may all those joints function. Touch. He was right. I just claimed it. I knew that was for me. It's no coincidence. And I just, I shot up, lifted up my hand, and was like, yep, I'll take that. That's for me. And that very night, I just felt a, a heat like a pretty intense heat. And the next day, it was gone. And it wasn't just gone. The craziest part is this right leg is no longer too long. I don't know what happened. It was like that for 10 years, but that is not a problem at all. It never has been ever since. Alex can now enjoy life and his adventures in the outdoors pain-free. God wants to heal you. He wants to be in your life. and. He loves us. He is love. He can't not love. And if you would just allow him, it's not even about us or what we do or how we do things. It's just, it's so much more about God. Like if you just allow him in and just let him love you and give him that time, you're going to see your life change completely and you will be whole and healed. I love what Alex said, just let him love you. Just let him love you. We want to pray for you, but here's some, something. Jonathan, who lived in Inman, South Carolina, uh, had lost his voice after having surgery. While watching this program on March the 11th of this year, Terry said, someone else, you're a singer, you've lost the ability to sing. I'm not quite sure, but it breaks your heart because you're a worshiper and God's restoring and lift up your voice. And as Terry finished, Jonathan's voice came back. He's singing again and praising God. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, this is Sama, who lives in McKinney, Texas, suffered for over 20 years with the same terrible sinus condition. On March 22nd, she was watching this program, and she heard me say, someone has sinus issues. You're dreading this season of the year. God's healing you right now. Just put your hand over your face, and your sinuses will be made whole. And then, Pat, you said it may be a follow-up from what Terry was talking about. You have a terrible nasal discharge, and it just keeps discharging. You're completely healed in your nose, your lungs, and your respiratory system, take it. So by faith, Sama claimed it. She called two days later, still rejoicing over complete healing after all these years. Listen, we want to join together right now and pray for you. Father, thank you for these miracles. And as the man said, just let God love you. And we love you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we receive your love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my Father. Thank you, my Father. A heart murmur. You, you've been you've been having a murmur. You, you, it's, uh, they use the term tachycardia, and it's just not your heart isn't quite beating right again. In the name of Jesus, Marcel, I believe it is. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Touch him. Yeah. Terry. Someone else with kidney dysfunction, and God is healing that condition for you. You're not going to need surgery or anything else. It's just going to be healed in Jesus' Thank you. name. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Someone else, you've dropped something on your foot and you're having a terrible bruise, deep, deep bruise. Hasn't healed because you have to keep walking on it. God's healing that for you right now in his name. Amen. There's an ear discharge. There's an infection, I believe, in your left ear. Your left ear is, is discharging. And you just put your hand on your ear and that infection will go away and you will be healed in Jesus' name. Bless them. And Lord, bless this nation yes. and bless those who serve you and give us your, your way that we might live for you in this land. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We leave you with this word from the book of Job. And though you started with little, you will end with much. Well, tomorrow, Ken Starr joins us live with his battle to protect religious freedom. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye.